Today on Mysteries and Monsters, I'm delighted to welcome John Russell, psychic and paranormal investigator. John has been connected to the paranormal for over 60 years through his personal abilities and deep interest in the paranormal. John, delighted to welcome you to the show for the first time. Thank you for joining me. Oh, Paul, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. This is really great, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, speaking to me from your home in Florida. You've recently released your second book, I believe, right. A Knock in the Attic, which is... Correct. Looking at it, John, and, and reading through it, it seems that this seems to be quite a, an autobiographical book in regards to how your abilities and your interest in the paranormal started. So... What I was struck by is that it just seems to all start from this early encounter as a five-year-old, doesn't it? Yeah, everything began then. Um, I was five years old, and I was sound asleep in bed. And for some reason, I woke up absolutely wide awake. No grogginess, no, um, you know, just I was just totally wide awake. And I thought, well, this is really odd, and I couldn't figure out the reason why. And my parents had a nightlight on that they left on in the hallway, down the hallway from my bedroom. And I raised up on my elbows, just kind of look around, kind of befuddled as to what was going on. And down the hallway, around the uh, the doorway in one of the doors down the hallway, peeking around the doorway was the face of this old black man. And I screamed bloody murder because we weren't a black family. We were white and we didn't have any black people living with us. And I presumed an intruder had entered the home. And as I screamed, he walked around the doorway and into the hallway and closer to my bedroom. And I can tell you what he had on. I can tell you what he looked like. If I saw him today, I'd recognize him. He was full bodied, just as solid as you or I. He had close cropped white hair, uh, a really handsome face. Um, he had on a red plaid shirt and tan khaki pants and a black belt, black shoes. And like I say, just as solid as you or I. And his appearance was not at all threatening. Uh, his demeanor was very benign, but nonetheless, it, it scared the dickens out of me. And I screamed again. My parents came running. And as my parents came running, he began to become translucent. And then he became transparent. And then he disappeared entirely. And um, my parents, uh, I, I convinced them that somebody was in the house, even <laughs> though I had just seen him disappear. Yeah. And my fright was so real that my parents, my my dad actually looked in the closets under the beds, checked all the doors and windows. And, of course, everything was locked up tight and there was no one there. And they tried to convince me that it had just been a nightmare. And I knew better. I knew I had seen my first ghost. And having seen that ghost then, Paul, as a result of that, that opened up the doorway, a portal, if you will, to the paranormal for me. And since that time, I've had well over a thousand paranormal manifestations in my life. And these are real manifestations. They actually occur on the physical realm. It's not something I've dreamed or meditated or hallucinated or envisioned or anything like that. These are real experiences that actually occur. A lot of times other people witness them. We have photographed them. We've um, recorded them, so on and so forth. And then in addition to opening that portal to these experiences, I became aware of my psychic gift then around the same time. And so apparently this uh, this old black ghost, this old black gentleman, his job was to come and open that portal and wake me up and activate my psychic gift and make me aware of all of that. And he did. And it's been a great, marvelous, exciting life full of wonder and adventure and incredible experiences. Yeah. So you grew up in, in Texas, I believe, John, with your family. I grew up, yes, in West Texas. I grew up in West Texas, right. Were you ever able to kind of solve where this spirit had come from, where this gentleman had uh, had arrived from, or do you just presume it was your turn and this chap was there, as you say, to kind of open your eyes to the, your reality? Because regardless of, of any kind of experience in that manner, John, seeing a ghost when you're five years old is usually frightening enough. I would imagine it became quite unusual to suddenly realise that perhaps your perception of the world around you had had changed completely because of this experience. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, a drastic change. And, um, you know, the, um, the appearance of the ghost was frightening. The realization of what was happening to me and the changes occurring in my life were frightening. And it took me a long time before I could go to bed and not look over my shoulder and not raise up and look around the room every now and then. 
uh, because I kept expecting the ghost to come back. And I was like, why? <laughs> you know, what would he ask me? What would he do? <laughs> would he scare me? Would he want me to do something frightening? Yeah. And I think uh, I think you hit it when you said that uh, the, the ghost was probably just it was my turn. And uh, the ghost came and said, OK, I'll, I'll go wake this guy up. I'll make him aware of his gift and we'll activate that and I'll open the portal so he can have these experiences. And uh, down the road, he's going to become a pro at this and help people around the world. And uh, and that's what happened. So it was very enjoyable. And as a side of that, uh, I have never been scared again. I've never been frightened again. And mm -hmm. of all the experiences I've had now, I can say I've been startled. Yeah. Uh, if you know you're absolutely alone in the house. And you turn around and someone's standing there, and you <laughs> jump, and uh, when they disappear, then you go, oh, okay, it's, it's the folks from the other side. And, uh, but I've never been scared again. I've never been frightened again. And uh, of all the experiences I've had, uh, some have been very bizarre. Some have been a, a little creepy, uh, but I've never had anything that's really scared me since. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You've certainly got to keep your wits about you, John, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so... I noticed that you eventually became a professional reader um, by around the age of 18, John. So how was that kind of development from being this child that had this experience and discovering that perhaps you were more perceptive to the spiritual realm at that age and that developed through your childhood? Because I know there's a, an amusing story in your book where you refer to a, a family friend and, and going on holiday and start telling them right, what right. they've been up to and it's you can kind of feel your parents giving you this kind of deathly stare <laughs> John, in <laughs> exactly. regards to like you know exactly. careful what you're saying about it. so how did your family view this did it eventually get to a point where they just went yeah we think john might be onto something here because i would imagine as you refer to there when you had your first experience with the the spirit that came to see you they would probably put this down to an overactive imagination or, or just perhaps some childhood fantasy. But clearly, as things developed, John, they certainly realized that that wasn't what was going on. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And uh, my mother uh, have, was always a believer in the paranormal. And my dad, who was actually my stepdad, he was kind of a closet believer. Uh, and he didn't understand it. And it scared him. So he didn't want to try to understand it, and he didn't want to get close to it. But as uh, the experiences began to occur in my life, uh, like the, the incident with the friends that came over, uh, it was obvious that something real was going on in my life and that I did have a real gift. And we had such a plethora of paranormal manifestations and experiences began around that time and continue constantly uh, so that they were aware that, yeah, there's there's something real going on here. And then when I, the way that I made it to become a professional reader around age 18 was I had studied everything I could get my hands on because it interested me. And I was always a seeker of the truth. I wanted to know what really worked, what didn't, so on and so forth. So I studied everything I could and I practiced my gift mm. and I developed my gift. I learned to listen to the other side. And uh, around the early teenage years, I began to do readings for people, and I also fell in love with the tarot, and being an artist and a photographer, I love the imagery of the tarot. It really speaks to me, mm. and so I began to utilize the tarot a lot in my readings, and uh, by the time I was 15, 16, uh, I was reading a lot for family, uh, family, uh, friends of the family, and so on and so forth, and then I began to get a little bit of a reputation uh, there, people would drive 200 miles one way to get a reading with me <laughs> and things like that. And then by the age of 18, uh, I began to uh, to accept money for the readings and then went on to, to be professional and to start reading professionally at age 18. Yeah. So what I often found really interesting as well, John, is that you've ended up becoming an associate pastor, I believe, as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Was that something that developed through your connection to the spirit realm as a, as a teenager and it was something you wanted to move into as a young man or did you find that was just your general calling and you had a, a wider appreciation of all aspects of the spiritual realm as it were? Yeah Paul I think it was that a wider appreciation of everything and I just kind of stumbled into it and I had been a, uh, a student of the Bible and a student of religion and as well as the occult the paranormal spirituality everything mm. and uh, it seemed at the time like a logical next step for my life experience and my life lessons. 
and I actually did become an ordained minister, uh, not the degree mill, mill kind, but the real uh, kind in a, in a real church. Mm. And then uh, afterwards, uh, I served as a time, as a brief time, for an, as an associate pastor of a small church. And altogether, that time frame lasted close to a decade. And um, I got to see uh, the machinations of organized religion from the inside out instead of the outside in. And what I saw, Paul, wasn't pretty. Hmm. And uh, so at, at, uh, at some point, I realized that I would have to make my break with organized religion and pursue everything from a purely spiritual point of view without attachment, dogma, ritual, tradition, and so on and so forth. But the experience I had uh, as an ordained minister, well, still am ordained, legally ordained, but as an ordained minister and as an associate pastor of that church and all the counseling that I did with people and all the things I experienced, uh, in spite of the fact that it wound up opening my eyes in ways that I wished it hadn't and left a bad taste in my mouth, nonetheless, the experience was invaluable. Mm. Did you find it a very difficult conflict at times? I would imagine probably not more so for yourself, John, because you seem quite comfortable in your ability to kind of engage with all aspects of this spiritual concept rather than, right. as you refer to there, keeping yourself tied to any particular dogma or, or framework. Right. Do right. you think that's given you a better appreciation of everything that's that's allowed you to kind of break free from those shackles and embrace it fully? I do. And it's it's given me a lot wider viewpoint on everything. When you study everything uh, without preconceived notions and you just study what it is, then you learn that at the root of basically every religion Every religion has its own scriptures. Every religion has its own doctrines. And unfortunately, the bottom line with every religion is it comes down to us versus them. We've got the truth and you don't. And if you don't believe our way, uh, you're going to be punished somehow, uh, you know, divinely or supernaturally or by God or by whatever. There's always some kind of separation or punishment or banishment or whatever involved, and that's in every religion. Most people don't realize that, but if you study every religion at its core, all religions are us versus them. And uh, I, I sat one day and I realized that, you know, not everybody can be right. Uh, you know, everybody proclaims to have the only right way, and everybody says that, and everybody can't be correct. Mm. And so I realized at that point that, uh, okay, I have to move outside of uh, the, the realms of dogma and tradition and ritual. And I had to do that in the, the purely spiritual realm, the paranormal realm as well, because there are people in the paranormal community that are very high bound in their particular belief systems about maybe what ghosts are or what UFOs are or whatever. And once they adopt that particular belief system, then they're immune to any criticism or any viewpoints that are, uh, are different than theirs. And so my whole purpose in, in developing my spiritual gifts, uh, my credo has always been to follow the truth no matter where it took me and to try and find out what that truth was. And for me, uh, it's always come down to what works in the physical realm. You know, it's great to have uh, theories and it's great to postulate things, but we can do that all day long and it doesn't help us. It doesn't heal us. It doesn't prosper us. It doesn't enlighten us. It doesn't help us as human beings, and it doesn't help us in the world. And for me, that's my hot button is how can we apply what we've learned and make life better for ourselves and for other people and, so, and without dogma, without ritual, without tradition, and to try things and see if they work. And if they don't work, get rid of it, and then let's try something else. And maybe something works for me. And that something doesn't work as well or doesn't work at all for you. Well, let's try and find something that does work for you. Uh, but let's not be accusatory or threatening or uh, divisive in that process. Mm. I think it is very interesting as well as you touch on there, John. I think regardless of whichever aspect you approach this field in, most people will, whether they believe it or not, have a dogmatic approach to whichever side they come from whether they are a believer or a skeptic more often than not they will have a preconceived notion as you touch on there about 
what a ghost is, what psychic ability is, what causes hauntings, where things go, how do spirits interact with people, why do people claim to have these interactions. And I think often people will say on both sides you need to be more open-minded or sceptical about it and yet when you try to discuss certain aspects with them they will come at you with a very well-maintained belief system that is extremely rigid. Exactly, exactly right. I remember one of the funniest things, you know, people think that it's just mainline Christianity or that it's other religions that are, are so dogmatic. But I remember one time uh, there was a, a, a pagan organization and, and by definition, by the very definition of the word, strictly pagan, a pagan belief system that uh, was organized. And they had a radio show and they wanted me to come on the radio show. Mm. And so they, they said, are you pagan? And I said, well, in some of my beliefs, I hold what could be construed as probably some pagan views, yes. Mm -hmm. And I told them I had had all these concrete paranormal manifestations on the physical realm and had made all these accurate predictions for my clients and public predictions that were accurate and had all these experiences. And that wasn't good enough for them. They were like, yes, but are you pagan? Not just do you have some pagan beliefs, but are you actually a pagan? And I wasn't, and they wouldn't take me on the station because I wasn't a quote-unquote pagan. So even in the spiritual realm, people <laughs> get hidebound with their, their belief systems and their dogma, their traditions. And, and I, I thought that was one of the more ironic and hilarious uh, examples of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you've got a, a, a vast testimony of, of radio work as well, John, in your, right. in your resume. So how did you gravitate into that field? Because... That's, I suppose, is something quite unique as well, because you seem to have worked for different radio stations across a lot of states as well. You've not just basically found yourself bound to the Texas borders. You've spread your right. wings, as it were, across the U.S. Right, right. Over 40 different stations and podcasts now and uh, 15 years on the radio. And the way that came about, Paul, was really interesting. It was uh, I was living in upstate New York at the time. And uh, out of the blue, I got this call from this guy that wanted me to be uh, on his radio show. And this was back before uh, podcasts were, were the thing. This was all radio back then. And so he wanted me to be on his radio show. And I said, well, sure, I'd be delighted and uh, became a regular guest on there. And <clears throat> excuse me, just out of the blue, uh, that just seemed to open a floodgate. And radio stations just begin to call me literally out of the blue and say, hey, we'd love to have you on the air. And that's how it all started. And um, the really neat thing was most psychics, if they get invited on a radio station, uh, they make one or two appearances or some occasional appearances or, or whatever. And that's the extent of it. And with the radio stations that I got on, I was a regular on there. Uh, once a month for years, sometimes two, three years. And uh, at one point, I was a regular on four stations a month. And on one of those stations, I was on every single week during the month. And this went on for years and years and years at these stations. And it grew and it grew. And uh, I was so popular as a guest that um, all the all the DJs would tell me that when they announced that I was going to be on, People would start calling the station an hour before I even came on the air, trying to get in, trying to talk to me, and uh, which was a real blessing and a real honor to me to to be <laughs> to have that popularity with people. And one of the stations, it was really funny, Paul. The uh, they I blew up the switchboard so badly <laughs> that people couldn't call the station, and the people that worked at the station couldn't call out for a period of time. I just completely fried the switchboard. And uh, when that happened, uh, some, some of the listeners had some of the DJ cell phone numbers and they began calling the DJ cell phone numbers, <laughs> trying to get through to me and talk to me. So it was a, a really blessed time and a, and a really wonderful experience. And I would discuss things paranormal and answer questions about the paranormal and do a little quick um, one to two minute mini readings on the air for callers. And I was very, very popular. I, I loved all the hosts. I loved all the people that called in. It was just a marvelous time. And that went on for a long period of time, uh, 9, 10, 11 years, and then stopped, just literally overnight stopped. 
and through no fault of my own and through no desire of my own. And what was so weird about it was it just suddenly nationwide became not popular to have a psychic on the air as a, as a regular guest anymore. And so that began to, uh, to fade away. And concurrent with that, here in the U.S., we had uh, lots of stations around that time that were selling out, and the new owners would change the format literally overnight mm -hmm. and, like, drastically. Like, if it was a rock station, then it became a country station yeah. overnight. Yeah. And they would fire the entire staff, including the on-air talent, from the top down. And, and the DJs would tell me this. We discussed all this when it happened. And they said, you can apply for your job back, but no guarantee you'll get it. And, of course, most of the people I knew then in radio just scattered far and wide, and we never uh, kind of reconnected for that reason. And the worst example that uh, that I had was one of the stations that I was a regular on. He called me one morning, and I said, oh, hey, it's nice to talk to you, but I said, we don't have radio today. What's up? And he said, well, I'm calling to tell you there won't be radio any longer. And I was like, why? What's happened? And he said, John, while I was live on the air on a hot mic, the new station owner came in with armed guards, kicked us off the air, made us put all our stuff in boxes and take it to our cars in the parking lot while the armed guards watched and escorted us out. And then they literally put a chain and a padlock on the door, and that's how they changed the format. <laughs> so for a number of years, that was the end of my radio career, and I really missed it. I, I love being on the air. I love being uh, talking to the DJs and talking to the guests that called in. And... Uh, so I missed that, and, and nothing ever clicked, nothing ever happened again. And then just all of a sudden, here it came again. I had a guy I'd done radio with, and he started doing podcasts, and he called me up and said, hey, I'm getting back into this again. Would you be interested? I said, sure. And then uh, I was on Coast to Coast AM with George Nuri, hmm. and a lot of people heard me on there and wanted me for their podcast from that. And then from there, it just kind of blew up, and then boom. Now I'm back on the air again, and it's great. I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. But it was so funny. It just came out of the blue in the first place and disappeared into the blue <laughs> at the end of that run. And then here it is coming out of the blue again, and uh, and I'm enjoying it again. So it's a great time. Yeah, it is something I've I've got some personal experience with as well, John, because I'm I'm someone that's always listened to radio stations from around the world. And obviously, having visited the States, on my last visit, I found a wonderful radio station in florida and i loved it and it was right. obviously in the early days of the internet so i was delighted to return back to the uk and, and discover that i could listen to this radio station here in the uk in my bedroom or, or my office or wherever you know listening right. to the the sounds of florida um Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know and i know it's 15 16 years ago but still it was you know it kind of takes you back and you have the memories of your trips and things like that and the places you've gone absolutely and I used to listen to this radio station regularly, you know, once, twice a week, just stick it on for a few hours and have it on in the background. And it was great. And then I put it on one day and it, it had completely changed. It had, as you say, literally overnight, it had gone from a, a, a retro 80s pop station to become a, a, a dance station overnight. And I was like... Why? How right. on earth did the, does this happen? And that, that was the same thing. They've got all these DJs and everything. And every, I think it was on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, it had completely flipped into this brand new station, completely new DJs, done. Yep. Very, very <laughs> strange. Very, very strange. So that's radio. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It certainly is a cutthroat business in the States. I know that too well, like I say. It is. It absolutely is. Alongside all this as well, what I found very interesting in regards to your your life and your career is that you've often done a lot of paranormal investigations, but not primarily as one would suspect someone with psychic abilities would be John. Right. Um, right. Often people would say, Oh, if, if someone's a psychic, they will go and try and contact people to find out more about the houses or whatever. But you seem to have a real kind of interest in hauntings rather than that kind of psychic connection, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I do. Uh, it does. I, and I have an interest in all of it, actually. My my thing, the way I got into uh, formal paranormal investigations was, again, going back to my childhood and into my teenage years and uh, this quest for the truth. Mm. What's real? What isn't? Is there a real haunting here or not? Is it myth? Uh, is it somebody's overactive imagination? Uh, did a squirrel run across the roof and somebody said, oh, there it is. There's a ghost, you know. <laughs> so there, there were a lot of things yeah. that I discovered you could disprove. There were a lot of things that I discovered that people misinterpreted. 
And then I discovered there were uh, the real manifestations. And that's what I wanted to get to the bottom of, what was and what wasn't. And then of those manifestations, for me, it's never been about let's provoke it and say that it's there. Oh, did you see it or hear it? Yes, I did. Did we record it? Yes, we did. Okay. But what does that do? That doesn't tell you why the manifestation is occurring and what the spirit wants to communicate and what you can learn from that and uh, and that type of things. Now, you don't always get that answer, uh, unfortunately. We don't always find out the exact reasons why. That's like in the... Uh, in my book, A Knock in the Attic, I talk about the dropped marble noise when I was a kid. And that manifestation, we could never attribute to anybody or anything, and we could never figure out what it meant. And we tried, but we just, there was never no answer there. So sometimes we don't get answers, but I think most of the time there are answers there if we'll try. And if we'll have patience and take the time to interact with the spirit, interact with the ghost, interact with the manifestation and say, OK, why are you here? Is there anyone in particular you're trying to communicate something to uh, that, that type of thing and really work at it? I, you can't go in and just spend one night and say, OK, well, we got an EVP. We got the answer. We're out of here on to the next uh, next uh, house or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, you got to spend some time there. You got to take some time. Uh, for one thing, it's like I've always said. You can't make an appointment with a UFO. You know, we take what we can get from the other side when we can get it, and the other side plays peekaboo with us for whatever reasons. So when I go to a place to do a paranormal investigation, I want all the time that I can take. If it's only one day, I want all the hours I can get in that day. Uh, If I can spend several days there or a week there, in some cases even more, uh, I want to take advantage of that because you don't know when the best manifestations are going to occur and you want to be aware and ready and seeking those and available to those when they do happen. So um, that's really what led me into the paranormal investigations and my, my mindset about them. Like I say, let's not just say, okay, we, yeah, there was a knocking in the walls. Well, why was there a knock in the walls? And like I say, sometimes you don't get that answer. You get little hints or little clues, or you may speculate but a lot of the time you can you can understand why some manifestation is going on. And I think that has to be the drive of serious paranormal investigators. So, OK, why? You know, this is happening. Why is it happening? And what can we learn from it? And what do we need to do or the persons involved need to do and uh, and that type of thing? So that's that's the real hot button for me there. Yeah, because I think you've got to take into consideration if you are going into the world of the paranormal investigation, John, there are. A variety of different types it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of situation you will have events that are cyclical that will happen on certain days or or certain right. times of the day or or certain days of the week or you will have things that will just happen all the time and i would imagine as your investigations develop you would come across different types of paranormal investigations and different types of hauntings no doubt Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you say, some things do seem to be cyclical and other things seem to be like a one time appearance, like they occur and they get whatever message they want to across. Or sometimes it's just a kind of a, hey, we're here kind of thing and they get whatever attention they want. And then that ceases and uh, ceases to exist, ceases to be. And I've experienced that. And uh, then there are other manifestations that kind of seem to beckon to you to learn more and explore more. And uh, one example of that in in my first book, Writing with Ghost Angels and the Spirits of the Dead, I had a lucid dream, which I was uh, led to a place that turned out to be a real location that I didn't even know existed. And when I got there to that location, I asked my guys on the other side, I said, "Okay, it's real. It's here. You've led me here. Now what? They said, we're not going to tell you right now. (laughs) It's going to take a process of you coming (laughs) back several more times because there's a progression of learning here for you that we want to expose you to. And Paul, I'm like everybody else. I want all my answers yesterday and I want all my knowledge right now. (laughs) I'm as impatient as everybody else, but uh, that was the message that was given to me. So uh, sometimes we're beckoned to a, a certain place and there's stages there that we have to go through and things that we have to learn in stages. And maybe it's for life lessons or maybe it's our spiritual growth or whatever. But uh, sometimes that occurs and and I've had that experience. Yeah. So it's almost as if you've got to be prepared and ready for it. And when you're equipped to deal with whatever's there, that's when your mind opens up to it, no doubt. 
Exactly, exactly. And I tell people, always have your intuition active. Always be listening. Always pay attention. It's like I literally believe in guardian angels. And when people read my books, they'll they'll learn why. Uh, and I the, and people always say, you know, especially skeptics will say, well, I was just in an accident. Where was my guardian angel? Well, we have to listen. We have to cultivate our intuition and get to the point where we can listen and hear the voices of our guardian angels. And then if they tell us to do something or not to do something, we have to obey. It doesn't do any good at all to get the leading or the answer or, or the direction and then not do it, not obey it. And uh, so in my life, I've learned that when they tell me to do something, I do it. And it saved my life many times, literally. Yeah. I mean, obviously, as, as, a, as a keen motorcyclist as well, John, I, I, I know you're you're quite keen to, to put down a couple of experiences that you've had as a rider down to intuition or, or a guardian angel. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, there was uh, one incident I write about in my first book. Uh, I've been a biker since I was about 15 or 16, and I turned 67 this month, so I've been around the block a few times. <laughs> and on my current bike, I've got almost 114,000 miles on it and love to ride. So uh, I had mm -hmm. scheduled myself a day off, and I was riding and having a grand time, and I was just tooling around uh, in the right lane, which is supposed to be the slow lane, and the speed limit, which is 70 miles an hour on the interstates here, nobody obeys. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, the right lane, people go 80. The middle lane, people drive 90 to 100. And the left lane, that's the lane where people imagine they're training for the Daytona 500. <laughs> and, uh, so, so all bets are off. Yeah. So, and I have to uh, to mention that I have uh, very good high speed riding skills. Uh, but that particular day, I just wanted to lollygag and enjoy the scenery. It was a beautiful blue sky, sunshine day with no wind, and uh, it was a good scenery, beautiful countryside. And I just wanted to lollygag in that right lane and enjoy the scenery and just have a good time. And as I'm rolling along down the highway, this voice says, move into the far left lane. Now, I have talked with the guys on the other side and received enough information from them that I should know better not to, than to argue. But I argued. I said, you know, look, I'm comfortable here. It's going to take a lot of riding to weave through this traffic and get in the left lane. And then they go, John, move into the, to the left lane now. Mm. So I'm like, okay, that I cannot argue with. So I begin the process of downshifting, throttle on, throttle off, upshifting, brake on, brake off, bob and lean, lean and weave, and working my way through all this speeding traffic to get in the left lane. And it's going to take me a lot longer to tell you about this than, than the amount of time it went through to actually happen. Uh, it, it was just split seconds. Yeah. And when I got into the left lane, over in the right lane where I had just been, uh, this car either hit someone or got hit and actually spun around and was facing the wrong way on the one-way interstate. And I remember looking over and watching it happen. And as, as the guy's car spun around, our eyes actually made contact as his car was spinning. And detritus from the wreck began to, like shrapnel, began to fly across the lanes, fly across the road. And I was busy dodging that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, my God, if I had not not only listened, been attuned, and developed that intuition to hear that voice of my guardian angels, but if, if I had not obeyed what mm. they told me, then I'd be dead. I wouldn't be here to talk to you right now. I'd find out what the other side's actually like in person. But because I listened, then I was spared, and uh, and I was okay. Uh, and where I had been, I would have hit him. He would have hit me. No telling how many other cars would have hit me, and that would have been the end of it. But mm. the voices that I know and love and trust spoke to me, told me what to do. And the important thing is I listen. And that's one of the things, Paul, that I've seen happen to people. They say, well, you know, I, I had a feeling not to drive down this road, but they didn't listen. Or mm. they said, you know, I, I, I knew I should have done this, but I didn't do it, and then I lost out. And so there's tons of experiences like that, tons of things. And sometimes even people that – uh, are victims of crime or like serial killers and they they manage to get away and escape they'll say you know i had a feeling not to go to this shopping center tonight but i went anyways i needed something and and i went there uh or people say you know i, I had a feeling not to turn down the street or to avoid this neighborhood or whatever and they go against that so when you go against that you go against it at your peril 
So for the skeptics that say, well, where was my guardian angel? Well, they're trying to talk to you if you'd listen. <laughs> and then when you and and then when you listen, you have to obey. You have to do what they tell you. Yeah, I think it is one of those things as well, John. That if you're ever in a situation where something incredible happens, or you you have what people would call a near death experience, perhaps. Right. I walked out of a seventy mile an hour car crash without a scratch, not a scratch wow. on me. Wow. And it's one of those things that I think afterwards you're in shock a little bit, primarily oh, sure. because you think, how on earth. Have I got out of this without a scratch? Yeah. How did I survive? And it's it, it often gives you more questions than answers as well, because like you say, you you sometimes have a gut feeling about a situation or or an event. Or, or right. like you say, some people make decisions not to do things as well. I mean, history is littered with people changing their minds at the last minute about taking trips. I mean, there are several stories about the Titanic, for prime example, John. And, oh, sure. And, yeah. and certain people changing air travel plans and things like that and... and accidents and, and terrible crashes happen so it is it is a very interesting aspect that is that a guardian angel is that what people would call a gut instinct and if it is is it the same kind of thing i think that uh, that there are literally guardian angels that there are entities that do watch over us and protect us and help us and our intuition is the tool through which they reach us through which they speak to us yeah and like you say it's just a question of whether you're, you you take it on board for whatever reason you might you know you might not put right. it down to that kind of particular communication, John, but some people do put real stock in just having a funny feeling about things. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, you know, like I say, whether you uh, carry it further and say, well, that was my guardian angel or that was my spirit guide or whatever, uh, you know, however you come to that realization, just be thankful that you have it and that it's there and that you've learned to listen to it. And our intuition can be trained. We can learn to listen to our intuition and we can learn to connect with the other side and receive that guidance and, and so on and so forth if we'll take the time to do it. The problem is we're too plugged in. We're too wired. Uh, we always are scrolling on our cell phone or we have the earbuds in or we have music going or the TV going or whatever. And we have to learn to completely disconnect. No music, no noise, no sound, no cell phones, no calls. No, no television, no radio, nothing, and just sit in the quiet and listen and learn how to receive what the other side is trying to get to us and trying to tell us. Uh, the analogy I use is if you and I were in a, a large room and there was a party going on and people are laughing and, and uh, talking and carrying on loudly as they normally do at parties, mm -hmm. I could probably yell at you from across the room and you wouldn't be able to hear me. But if everybody in the party suddenly went silent, then I could talk to you across the room in a normal tone of voice and you'd hear me quite clearly. Mm. And so that's the way it is with the other side, communication from the other side. We've got all this noise going on that keeps us from hearing the voice of our, our guides and our guardian angels and so on. And when we learn to be quiet so that we can hear, they'll begin to communicate with us. Yeah. Once again, it's all about being ready and open for it, no doubt. That's it. Yeah, absolutely it is. I mean, one of the other aspects of, of your life and your work, John, is that I'm very interested in anybody that, that talks about the spirits of animals because I'm, I'm often perplexed where there are certain facets of the paranormal where people just do not discuss the concept of, of spirits of other living things, which I find right. quite peculiar that if you're willing to accept the concept of the ghosts of the departed, why would you just limit it to humans? Why wouldn't Absolutely. it be animals? So. Absolutely. And I'll tell you a really interesting experience that I had there. Mm. Uh, but I, I would like to amplify on what you said, Paul, because it's so true. Uh, we assume human intelligence, but there's a lot of intelligence out there. Mm. It may not be human intelligence, but it's intelligence nonetheless. Mm. Uh, for example, you can teach a dog all of these different commands uh, a dog can learn to differentiate between different sizes, shapes, and colors. And can, you say, bring me the red square, and it goes and gets the red square. Mm -hmm. So that's intelligence. It's not human intelligence, but it's intelligence. Uh, they have discovered that uh, now science, I saw a, a documentary, a scientific documentary, and they've discovered that trees will exude a chemical into the soil from their roots and and make the soil undesirable to competing trees around them. They send this chemical out that it's like 
this is mine. Stay away. Don't come yeah. over here. Keep your yeah. roots away from me. <laughs> so there's some intelligence. It's not human intelligence, but it's an intelligence at work. Um, one of the greatest examples I love was uh, there was a murder, and this guy had a uh, – I can't remember if he just had a lot of plants or if he had a, if it was a florist or whatever, but uh, there were these plants and and the guy was murdered and they had absolutely no uh, no clues, no witnesses or whatever, and they uh, said, well, and one guy said, well, we do have a witness, we have this plant, and they were like, oh, come on. And he said, well, look, <laughs> he said experiments have been done where they hook up electrodes to plants and then bring a cigarette lighter or a match toward a lit match toward the, uh, the plant, and the the graph that it's hooked up to goes crazy. The needles go crazy. So the plant's saying, don't burn me, don't burn me, get this flame away from me. So there's an intelligence, not human intelligence, but it's intelligent enough to know that it's in danger. So uh, he, they, he told him, he said, let's try this. And they had a suspect, but they couldn't get a thing at all on the suspect, and he seemed to have the perfect alibi. So... They rounded up him and, and some other people, kind of like you would do a lineup. Mm. And uh, they hooked up this this plant, and then they made up this story about they they had some some witnesses or something or some uh, somebody that I could, could identify the the perpetrator. I don't remember exactly the details, <laughs> but anyways, they bring these people in one at a time. There's no reaction from the plant, and when the suspect comes in, that they're pretty sure murdered the guy, the plant goes crazy. The plant goes wild. The graph goes goes nuts. <laughs> so the, the plant said, yep, there he is. That's the guy that did it. So that's an intelligence. It's not human intelligence, but it's an intelligence. I always get tickled when people look at things. And, you know, one of the, uh, I love this line from the, the movie I, Robot, where uh, Will Smith is questioning the robot. And he says, you know, can you write a symphony? And the robot looks at Will Smith and he says, no, can you? Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to adjust our thinking and adjust all these things. So exactly <laughs> right. Why do we assume that people have souls and animals don't? And uh, I have had two experiences where um, deceased cats that I dearly loved came back in the flesh to visit me, not in spirit, but actually in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those was uh, I had this uh, this little cat named Gizmo after the the character in the movie yeah and i love this little cat we would i would hold him and put his paw on my shoulder uh in my hand like we were dancing and i'd hum to him sing to him we'd dance around the room and he would just purr and he was the the sweetest most loving little thing well back then the way i was raised in west texas the dogs were outside the cats were outside you didn't have inside cats and dogs which is a very strange thing to me now yes but that's the way we were raised and, and that's what we did so um, at night, we would put the little cat out, and uh, then in the morning, we'd let him in. And I remember it was um, right at Thanksgiving. I believe it was Thanksgiving Eve. And we were sitting there in the house, and it was getting on toward twilight, toward dusk. And uh, it was a warm, warm evening, uh, warm for that time of year, which it sometimes typically is in Texas. Mm. And we had the wooden door open, the front door open, and, and just the screen door there. And all of a sudden, this little cat goes over to the screen door, and he starts clawing on it and meowing and, like, going crazy. And I knew he had been out and used the restroom, whatever, didn't need to go use the restroom. And I was like, well, what in the world is this? What odd behavior is this? And he was just absolutely frantic to get out. And I was watching something interesting on TV, and I told him, I said, Gizmo, wait a minute. I'll let you out in just a little bit. Just calm down. I'd never seen him act that way. And instead, he just just got more frantic and more frantic and just clawing at the door, trying to pull it open or push it open, whatever he could do. And I was like, well, my God. So I got up, opened the door, let him out. And he went flying out like his tail was on fire. And um, I would sit back down to watch TV. And I presumed he'd come back when he whatever went through his mind, whatever he needed to resolve, he did. And so the neighbors came over about 15, 20 minutes later however long it was, and told me that he had been hit by a car and was laying dead in the street. Oh. And absolutely, totally shattered me. Mm. And I could not for the life of me figure out why in the world he was so desperate to get out that door. And uh, it was like, you know, I don't know if he had the premonition that 
he this was going to be his time. He was going to go. This is how he was going to cross over or wanted to cross over. Or if there was just something else that gave him some urge to get out there and it was an accident, mm-hmm. I don't know. But it was the most odd behavior I'd ever seen. I never could reconcile it. And it just shattered me, absolutely shattered me. Mm-hmm. So years down the road, I had moved back to my old family home. And um, I was I also had this big red Doberman named Elsa and Gizmo knew, uh, knew Elsa and they loved each other. Hmm. And so I had still had Elsa and uh, she was in a pen outside. And so I was on the front porch changing a, uh, a, a light bulb out in the porch light and washing clothes. And I didn't have a dryer. My family had never owned a dryer. We had clotheslines in the backyard yeah. and we would hang the laundry up outside. So, uh, and my mom was dead. My sister had moved and I was there at the house by myself. Hmm. So, uh, I was on the porch and I hear this meow and from around the corner of the house running up onto the porch, 90 miles an hour comes this adult cat. That is the spitting image of gizmo, the exact spitting image and runs up to me, just loving and just meowing and carrying on. I'm like, my God. And I couldn't even stop myself. I said, gizmo. And, and so he's just loving all over me. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, well, surely not. This must be wishful thinking. It couldn't be, but it it was him grown up. And so I opened the door to take my, my stool in for I'd been standing on to change the, the light bulb. And he ran into the house and he was just purring and happy. And I was like, my God, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And I could pet him. I could touch him. And about that time, the the laundry finished, and so I gathered everything up in the basket, went to hang it out outside, and he came with me, and he just was so happy. He was jumping up into the air and rubbing against the laundry basket I was holding while I was carrying it. He would jump up in the air and rub against it while he was in the air and then land, and he was just overjoyed. Mm. And I was like, my God, this is the wildest thing I've ever seen. And Elsa saw him and let out this yelp that was almost a scream of like recognition, like gizmo. And he saw her and ran over there and laid down in front of her pen and they pawed each other through the, the chain link and just carried on and carried on. And I'm like, my Lord. So I uh, hung out my clothes and uh, he was still out there with Elsa. And so typical of the time, I went back in to get a bowl of milk and uh, yeah. <laughs> bring out for the cat. And so I got the bowl of milk, came outside, and that only took me a few seconds. And I came out, and I was here, kitty, 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 and looked around the corner, and the cat was gone. And never, never saw it again. There had never been any cat like that in the neighborhood. Uh, never never saw that cat again. Never had any other cat come around. And so I am absolutely, totally, completely convinced that that was Gizmo. My goodness. I mean, often you will have people, John, that have departed pets that will pay them a visit but i've never heard of one whether it's that it's an actual physical interaction to that level you know what i mean because often people will see them the the animal be it a a cat or a dog and they will see it in their house or they'll hear it or it will do something that it used to do when it was alive right i mean that is remarkable it's almost as if i mean how long had you been back home had you been home in the area a while or had you recently returned Oh, no, it was I, where we had lived uh, was just across town. Mm. And uh, when I went back to the old family home, then I had been there uh, a little while. Mm. And uh, so it had been several years since Gizmo had died. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. And I, and I have the same experiences that you and a lot of other people do that uh, we had some of our animals die here of old age and mm. uh, like one of their favorite toys we would hear it being batted across the floor and we were like oh there they are yes. but again we didn't we didn't see them we just saw the effect of the manifestation uh, but with gizmo that was an ad- actual literal manifestation that i could literally pet touch um see and uh, and then i had another physical manifesta- manifestation from uh, one of our cats here in florida that uh, had crossed over and he came back uh, physically, but I didn't get to touch him, but he was, he appeared in the flesh. He came back in the flesh. That is remarkable. I mean, it is. And especially for the dog to also interact with it. And yeah, as you say, you know, without wishing to sound or, or talking cliches, John, dogs and cats are not the best things, though occasionally they will make 
Brilliant. fantastic relationships and be as thick as thieves, which is always quite quite amusing when you see dogs and cats that basically love each other to death. Yeah. So for the dog to also have that kind of interaction and recognition right. gives it a whole different perspective as well, because often I think we don't put much scope in, in paranormal responses from animals, although people will often talk about their, their pets staring off at walls or or barking at things that aren't there, John, and often that will be a symbol that, or, or um, an indicator that something is occurring or something is about to occur. Exactly, exactly. So, that for the fact that your your dog also seemed to recognise his cat and have an interaction with it. Yep. How was she Incredible. after? Incredible. Yeah. How was the dog after she disappeared? Then was was she looking for her? Yeah, bum fuzzle. Uh, she was she was just bum puzzle. She was like, where 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 did he go? <laughs> and and, uh, and we were both pretty gobsmacked actually. It was like, okay, you know, here and then just disappeared a second later. Uh, and and uh, that seems to be uh, the case with these manifestations is that uh, they very quickly disappear. Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's almost as if he he came around just to welcome you home. Yeah, and just say, hey, I'm here. I made it. I'm okay. And uh, whatever happened, happened, but I'm all right now. And want you to know that I love you and I'll see you again. You know, which is what I believe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of people that seem to have that kind of interaction when they've they've had an experience or or like in in your situation, John, that you'd returned home, that someone comes back to say hi. Right, right. No, no, that's lovely. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And, uh, and I always tell people, I say, look, when you have these experiences, whether it's from an, an animal or a deceased loved one, a person on the other side, or an angelic presence or some type of entity, some type of spirit guide or nature spirit or whatever, don't discount it. Uh, cherish it and realize, you know, don't say, oh, that was just coincidence or wishful thinking or whatever. No, that's reality. And we need to treasure those moments and treasure the fact that we do get those communications from the other side and we do get guidance from the other side and we do get help and we do get evidence that the people we love uh, live on the animals we love live on and so on and so forth and i always tell my clients i say listen don't if you get up and you smell your your dead husband's cigar don't say oh that's just wishful thinking or a coincidence that's him communicating with you treasure that experience and realize and accept the reality of that and cherish that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you should take whatever it makes you feel like, John, whether it makes you feel happy or sad, just embrace it and and move on from it. Absolutely, absolutely. (sighs) Well, that's made me feel all warm and fuzzy. Thank you, John. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent, excellent. (laughs) So um, another aspect that I was really interested in was the work that you prepared in regards to to this fascinating sounding documentary that was looking into the assassination of Lincoln. And there's a couple of reasons why, John. Firstly, is your self-proclaimed lack of historical knowledge, other than the the basic uh, information in regards to to Lincoln's assassination on the 14th of April in 1865, which I found refreshing that your, your candid honesty about how little you knew about it makes the whole thing very interesting so how did this come about were you contacted out of the blue once again or was it someone that was aware of your work and thought that you would be a good fit for it john no i was contacted out of the blue once again uh back again when i was living in new york uh i got an email one day from atlas media corporation which is one of the biggest media corporations in new york and uh, they were looking for psychic talent for Uh, this proposed series titled Psychic History, in which the psychic would go to these various places and come up with what they thought had actually happened and so on and so forth, give the, enlarge the historical perspective from a psychic and a paranormal viewpoint. So I got that out of the blue and uh, got that email out of the blue and they wanted me to do a, uh, an audition tape for them. Uh, So an audition tape, You send it in, and then they decide if they're going to screen test you, if they like you enough to screen test you. So I made this audition tape, and Mm -hmm. uh, I called them up and asked them what they wanted and how to to do it. And so they said, well, just take your video camera, and your wife can video you and introduce yourself, talk about some things, and and let's just see how your presence is on camera and everything. Mm -hmm. 
So I had never done TV. I'd done a ton of radio, but I'd never done TV. And so I was like, well, okay, we'll give it a whirl. So my wife and I went up to uh, the attic in our, in our home there, which was a site of, of incredible paranormal manifestations. And we thought, well, that would be a good place to, uh, to shoot the, uh, the, uh, the audition tape. Yeah. And so we did. And, and we have, we would just crack up. She would put the camera up and start it and give me the signal to go. And I'd go, hi, I'm John Russell, internationally known psychic. And we would both just crack up, just die laughing. <laughs> and it took several takes before we could finally get serious enough to make it through. So well, I finally got a, a decent audition tape done and, and sent it to them. And so then they got back to me and they wanted to screen test me. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, this is pretty exciting. And, um, uh, I had been asking the other side for an opportunity like that because there's so much BS on TV about the paranormal. And I wanted the opportunity to kind of set things straight and give people some truth and some reality and some some things they could really sink their teeth into. And uh, so I said, well, man, this will be a great opportunity. Hmm. My, they sent uh, a guy out that was working for them at the time, with them at the time, as a producer, a writer, and so on, director. And... Uh, his name was Jim Mullen. He's still a good friend of mine. Mm. And he came out with one of the members of the camera crew and talked to me at my house. And he said, OK, well, this is how we're going to do the screen test. Well, he was a disbeliever. And most of the people in the in the crew was uh, were disbelievers. But it was popular then to have psychics on the show and to do that kind of show. Mm. So they had they had jumped on the bandwagon. He was like, OK, well, we're we're going to see who's who's film worthy here. And uh and uh, we'll we'll do this show. So uh, at the time, more so when I was younger, and I was a lot younger then even, and uh, more so when I was younger, it was my mission in life to make believers out of people. And so I set out to make believers out of the whole film crew. And so we went to shoot the screen test, and um, I, I was able to tell uh, the crew things that I had no way of knowing about themselves. Hmm. And so that kind of freaked him out a little bit. And then we went to locations that I made specific statements about, detailed statements about that, again, I didn't even know of these locations because I grew up in West Texas and didn't have any knowledge of New York at all. And uh, through research um, for some of the more out and left field statements I had made, they discovered I was right about the things I had said. Hmm. So that was very interesting for them. So they went from the screen test to saying, okay, we're going to shoot the pilot now. And I signed a a five-year contract with uh, uh, Atlas Media and the History Channel. And uh, we were shooting for the History Channel. So the great thing about that was there were some, uh, some shows that had already shot at some of these locations and people were disgusted with them because of the histrionics of these so-called psychics and, and phony paranormal investigators and goofy paranormal investigators. And so because of the cachet of Atlas Media and mm-hmm. because of the cachet of the History Channel and them saying, hey, we, we've got a guy that's the real deal and he's solid and he's not going to do anything stupid or pull any stupid stunts or bring any embarrassment on to you. Because of all of that, we were able to get into all of these places like Ford's Theater. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, without any tourists there, only us, just me and the film crew and no one else. And we were able to just spend as much time as we wanted in each one of those places. So it was a marvelous, marvelous experience. So that's how that came about. And then uh, going into this, I was like, well, psychic history. I said, listen, I said, I, I'm a good psychic, but I'm the worst student of history on the planet. I said, I hate history. I don't <laughs> like history. I haven't studied history. I, I'm the guy, and I'm not making this up or being melodramatic. This is a literal truth. I'm the kid that in class used to sit down and write cheat notes, crib notes on his hand and on little pieces of paper and look at them <laughs> for the history test. Okay. <laughs> And and I absolutely hated history. It's a detestable subject to me. So they said, you're the perfect guy because you don't know anything. So anything you come up with, it's going to be fantastic if we can validate it. So I said, okay. So from that perspective, that's how we went into, uh, went into the pilot. And um, the very first place we went, uh, oh, and I have to tell you something funny. And and this is in the book. Uh, We're, we're in the van filming and, uh, 
Well, I should go back even before that. In New York, now I'm, in, I'm raised in West Texas, a little aside here, but it's kind of relevant. It's kind of funny. Hmm. I was raised in West Texas, and at the time, if I'm walking into the grocery store and I see a woman coming out balancing a couple of bags of groceries, I was raised, you go over, take the groceries from her, say, ma'am, where's your car? You walk her to her car, and you know the groceries for her. Okay, yeah. that's, that's the way I was raised. So here we are. We're loading up the van in New York City and Manhattan to begin our drive to D.C. And, and all these places. And so I go over and grab one of the cameras to help load the van. And I learned two things, Paul. The first thing, my producer comes over to me and he goes, no, 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 put that down, put that down. He said, the talent doesn't lift things, doesn't do things, uh, because, look, what if you pick that up, sprain something, hurt yourself, we have to delay filming or even cancel filming? I said, oh, okay, I, I didn't think of that. And second, you're going to get all sweaty, and we can't film you if you're sweaty. We don't want you sweaty on camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that was the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned was those cameras guys pick up, and, or gals, and hold them on their shoulders out in the field while they're filming. Those things are heavy. <laughs> so, so we get in the uh, in the van, and we're going to, to D.C., and uh, he turns around with the camera and uh, – says, uh, I'm in the back seat, and they're in the front, and he turns around with the camera and says, we need a tagline, a little something we can come up with that identifies you in the show that when somebody hears it, they go, oh, yeah, that's that's psychic history. So come up with something. And I'm not known for thinking fast on my feet. I'm really not. <laughs> and so I, the only thing I could come up with at the moment was, I'm John Russell. Let's go find some ghosts. And he said, perfect. And so they took that and it mortified me because I hated it. I thought it was the stupidest line ever. <laughs> and and he gets a kick out of it to this day. He thought it was funny. So uh, anyway, so we get into D.C. and we begin filming. Now, people think, oh, must be really uh, prestigious and, and dramatic and, and exciting to film a, a TV pilot, to be on TV. It's not. It is the <laughs> hardest friggin' work. <laughs> we yeah. would get up. Casting call was at six in the morning. We would end filming if we were lucky at 6 p.m. And a lot of times we went to nine or 10 o'clock at night filming straight through. Mm -hmm. So it is hard, grueling work to film a series. So we get to, uh, to D.C. and our first stop is Ford's Theater. The only thing I knew about Ford's Theater, I knew that was where Booth had shot Lincoln. That was it. That was all I knew. So we're going up there, and my psychic intuition kicks in, and I said, and I laughed, and I turned around and looked at everybody. I said, watch, it's going to be locked. And Jim goes, no, no, no. He said, they know we're coming. They're expecting us. It's, you know, we've, we've set all this up. It's a big deal, you know. Mm. And I went up, grabbed the door, tried to pull it open. It was locked tight, and I just laughed. I said, I told you. And so <laughs> I had to call from outside, get the people to come unlock the door. He said, look, we're out here with the, the film crew and the talent. You know, here we are. Come open the door. <laughs> so I thought that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> so we get inside, and Paul, the energy there psychically that I could feel was so overwhelming it's it's really hard to describe mm. and what people don't understand people say well you know places change people come and go uh, places remodel repaint change carpet change upholstery whatever uh, you know nothing's the exact same as it was it doesn't matter the energy that occurred there is exactly the same as it was yeah. and no matter how much you repaint remodel do this, do that, all that energy is still there intact. Mm. And so I could feel all of this marvelous, wonderful energy and uh, went up to the presidential box where Lincoln was shot and uh, experienced all these things and, and told them that uh, Lincoln had had a premonition uh, of this assassination and that when, when Booth burst through the door in the back of his mind, he went, yep, here it is. And come to find out, it was uh, pretty common knowledge. We had a lot of Lincoln experts then that we interviewed, um, you know, afterwards and so on. And it was pretty common knowledge that Lincoln did indeed have a lot of premonitions mm. and had a lot of dreams that he considered to be uh, precognitive pre dreams. Yeah. And so um, I, I picked up on that and I picked up, I said, I said, when... Booth jumped from the, after he shot Lincoln, he jumped from the balcony onto the stage and he yelled something at the audience, but I can't understand it. I can't make sense out of what it is. Yeah. I, I know he yelled something, but I, it's, 
It's like foreign language to me. Well, it was. He yelled six semper tyrannis, which is Latin for thus ever to tyrants. Yes. And so I could hear him yell it, but I couldn't understand it. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of things like that. And then there was a, a ghost that appeared almost physically to me and showed me, beckoned me over there to the presidential box. And I was able to pick him out of pictures at the time uh, from the, identify him from pictures that they had. And he was one of the people that was in on the plot that had backed out. And uh, there were a lot of people in on this plot to kill Lincoln. A lot of people don't realize that, but there was a whole lot of people. Mm. And it wasn't just Lincoln. They were after the vice president. They were after other uh, important officials. And yeah. the goal was actually to bring down the government and plunge the country into chaos. Yeah. That was the actual goal. And as uh, as and I told him, I said, man, I said, Booth may have been the guy that, that was on center stage here. But I said there were a lot of people involved in this uh, assassination plot, and it went very high up and very deep. Mm -hmm. And one of the Lincoln experts said that it was Booth's hand that held the gun, but there were many fingers on the trigger. Yeah. So that was validation of that. And um, we went from one of the most interesting things. There's a museum underneath, and uh, there was a door there, and uh, there was a hole drilled in the door, and there's a plaque that says that Booth had the hole drilled so that he could look in and see when Lincoln was there and time his, his rush into the, uh, uh, the presidential booth there to, to shoot him, mm. the presidential box to shoot Lincoln. So I looked at that and I said, no, this is not right. And I mean, this is accepted history and this is what's on the plaque, the official plaque in the official museum there. And I said, no, this isn't right. And I said, Booth didn't drill this hole. He had it done and he had it drilled by somebody in the theater, like a carpenter or whatever, that wouldn't arouse suspicion. And sure enough, they did a ton of research after we did the uh, film, the pilot, and they found out that indeed Booth didn't drill the hole, that it was drilled by a carpenter mm. and uh, there at at the uh, at the theater so we were able to validate a lot of things like that that i picked up that some of those things even went uh, against the accepted norm of history and um, all throughout the thing they kept asking me uh was booth ever repentant was he ever sorry for his actions and i said no up until the very end he never repented he was never sorry for what he did he was proud of what he did mm -hmm. and uh, so we went on through all these marvelous places. We went to the Peterson house across the street, yeah. which is where Lincoln was taken that night after he was shot and where he died the next morning. And uh, we went to a lot of other places and wound up uh, at the Samuel Mudd house where Booth came to get his broken leg treated yeah. and had some marvelous paranormal manifestations there. I think we were the very first to use a FLIR camera, forward-looking infrared radiation. Mm. And there's been several people to use them in paranormal shows now, but I think we might have been the very, very first. Yeah. And what FLIR does, Paul, is it shows up on film, uh, cold is black and heat is white. So we're upstairs filming and they're filming alternately or rather simultaneously with the FLIR camera and with a regular camera. And we're upstairs and I hear this noise and I say, there's our ghost. And we come downstairs and everybody heard the noise. Hmm. And we come downstairs, and I'm standing there, and I ask if it was Mrs. Mudd, Mudd's wife. And she said, yes, it was her that made the noise. And I said, she's standing over here to the right of me, and she's walking toward me. And I said, it's getting extremely cold. And I said, now she's walking right through me. It's freezing. I can feel her walk through me, and she's coming out the other side. And as I said that, on the FLIR camera, it picked up these black footprints on the floor, which indicates cold. Hmm. And they were a woman's shoe in a woman's size and looked like period era shoes walking in the footsteps, walking across the floor toward me and passing through me as I said they were. And we caught that on film. So that was just phenomenal, just absolutely mind blowing. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is a very strange case, regardless of, of what other aspect you go at it, John, because obviously, Lincoln's wife was deeply spiritual, wasn't she? She had a lot of beliefs in superstition and the and and spiritualism as well as a, as her life developed. Well, Lincoln as well, yeah. Yeah, because I know um, there's a very famous, as you refer to Lincoln, 
allegedly dreamt about his own death and, and being laid in state, didn't he? And and claimed right. to have, um, I think it was his bodyguard, was it Lamon, the guy who, who a prime example of that, he, he disappeared for the interval where Booth managed to get in and nobody knows exactly. why he yeah. decided to go. And that's that's what I wanted to know was where was the bodyguard? <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, because obviously I know some people try to say, well, perhaps he was in on it, but they never they were, they were never able to prove anything, which... Right. You know, and obviously there was a massive investigation and, and several people were hung, as well as Booth um, being killed in the famous barn fire. Right, right. And he actually wasn't, he actually wasn't killed in the fire. Mm. Uh, what, had, what had happened was one of the cavalrymen, uh, Booth was in there with the, with the other guy he had, had ran away with, and they were hiding in this barn. Yeah. And we went to the location where the barn actually used to be, where the ranch, the farm actually used to be. Mm. And it's a, it's highway now. It's out in the middle of the Tuleys, out in the middle of nowhere. And it's just a two, it's highways going either direction mm. on either side of this median strip where the barn used to be. Yeah. And uh, what had actually happened was that uh, Booth was in there was a th with this other guy, and the cavalry surrounded the barn and told Booth to surrender and come out. And he said, this other guy wants to, but I'm not. And Booth uh, uh, remained steadfast that he wouldn't surrender and wouldn't come out. Well, Booth's leg was still bum, and he got up, and he was hobbling around on this broken leg and had his gun pointed at the, the barn door, and he was getting up ready to fight, basically. Mm -hmm. And so one of the cavalrymen had been watching him through the slats in the, uh, in the barn and had his gun trained on him, and he was intending to wing Booth or to shoot him in the leg or maybe the shoulder or something, just wing him and wound him so that he would fall down, they could run in and then capture him. Yeah. And as erratic as Booth was moving, uh, the cavalryman, when he fired his shot, he shot him in the neck yeah. accidentally because of Booth's erratic movement. And then that's uh, that's what killed Booth. That's They dragged him out, and then that's where he died there. And uh, so I was I was able to pick up on the, when we went there, uh, I was able to discern. I said, I, I see all these people on horseback coming with guns drawn. Well, that was the cavalry coming in, mm. and I perceived that. I, I got that, and I said, I'm I'm seeing that either Booth dies right here or very close to this area, and they don't have it marked. There were any markers or anything that I recall, mm. and uh, and they said, yeah, he died within a few yards of where we're standing right now. So uh, that was that was awesome. That was interesting to uh, to get. Um, get that information come through i mean how did you find the whole investigation because like i say it seems to be one of those things that in the in the realms of the paranormal because obviously lincoln's ghost is one of the most well-known uh spirits that haunts the white house and and famously right. there is a very uh, interesting anecdote from one of our legendary prime ministers here winston churchill who remarked that he was once stopping at the white house and had decided decided to uh, come out of I think he'd had a bath, John, um, and he walked out of the bathroom with his trademark cigar to see right. Lincoln sat in a chair next to the fireplace in the bedroom he was staying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, appearances of Lincoln's ghost, and um, the people at Ford's Theater looked at me like I was nuts when we were leaving. When we finished there, and we're going out. I uh, I talked to the the people that worked there the the docents the overseers whatever mm. and I said um, do you ever like leave something for Lincoln like go up to the box and like put flowers or put a little offering or put a little something of some kind and they looked at me like I was crazy like w w what for why would we do that and I said because his spirit still comes here sometimes and it would be a nice honorarium if you would kind of do that and say hey. You know, we, we remember you, we recognize you. And, uh, but they, they just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is one of those strange things as well, because I know the building, uh, obviously after what had happened with Lincoln was, was immediately shut down as a theater and the government took it over for a while, I believe. Um, and there was a very famous and tragic incident about 30 years later, wasn't there? Where I think the, the front of the building collapsed and killed about 20 people as well. Uh, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Um, and people just presume that this building was cursed, and I think that may be more to do with superstition because um, it, it wasn't a theatre for for a very long time. But it, it, obviously now it seems to have embraced its past and and its historical place in in American history now. 
Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and it is an active theater again now, yeah, so. Oh, fantastic. Oh, it was interesting. It was interesting, let me tell you. I can imagine, and especially getting the chance to sort of go through all that and relive it, especially as someone that was coming to it with a fairly blank canvas as well, John, which have been quite interesting for yourself. It was. It was a, a marvelous learning experience, and to learn it from the psychic perspective, from the supernatural perspective, and have that validated, have them do research afterward about the things I had picked up on and seen and felt psychically, and to validate everything that I had gotten that was really tremendous. But let me tell you, Paul, to walk where those people had walked, to walk in Lincoln's literal footsteps, mm. to to stand in the place of this dramatic history uh, was just uh, just mind blowing. Just, you know, what an incredible experience. And then, unfortunately, the pilot never aired. It never uh, never went to air. And we were all just really, really heartbroken about that. Um, I saw the. Uh, I saw the, the rough of the pilot after it was done. And it was funny because as we kept going to these locations and as we kept doing things, my producer said, Johnny said, I don't know how we're going to do this. He said, just in the short time we've been filming, we've got enough here for a series. <laughs> and he said, I don't know how I'm going to condense this down to a pilot. He said, it's just incredible. And so he did and did an incredibly wonderful job of it. And it captured everything in a really serious, really good manner. Um, and it was really, really exciting and really, really entertaining and really believable. And then it didn't go to air and we were just we were just beaten up with it. It was like, oh, my God, because I I believe it would have been a really phenomenal series. And uh, we could have uh, made a big difference in uh, people's belief systems and getting some information out there and and things that uh, that's not being done in that way today. And I think it would have really been a, uh, a real success. And I'm sorry it didn't go. Yeah, because I know I've, I've, I've seen Jim Mullen mention this and he said with the greatest respect at the beginning, he was quite sceptical about yourself and what what you could possibly uncover. And he said within a few hours and a few days of, of starting this production, John, he was he was blown away by what was coming out because people were verifying things that, as you refer to there, things like the, the hole, people yeah. had just misunderstood information. And it was your your kind of insights that opened up new avenues of investigation for people. Exactly right, yeah. And in addition to that, I had made it, like I said before, I had made it a personal vendetta to make everybody in the crew believers. <laughs> and so things would happen like, uh, I remember one incident, we were um, riding in the van, we were on, on our way to another location to film, and uh, Jim was on the phone with somebody, and... Uh, and I tapped him on the leg and I said, listen, I've got to interrupt you. And he goes, OK, he said, tells this guy, he said, hold on. I said, tell the guy, just hold on, but to not hang up, but just hold on. And he said, OK. And I said, uh, this guy that you're talking to, um, somebody just died like his aunt or his grandmother. Or There's some female relative that just died and he's been made the executor of the, the estate, the executor of the will. Ask him. And so he did, and the guy was like, "Well, yeah, my, you know, whoever it was just died, and I'm, I'm the executor of the estate. Yeah, why? How? Where did that come from? How'd you know that?" And he said, and "Then Jim tells him just a minute." And I said, "Listen, tell this guy, make sure he checks that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and when he's doing the uh, ex executing this estate." And uh, so Jim tells him that, and and the guy's like, "How in the world could you possibly know this?" And uh, Jim's like, well, we're filming the show with a psychic. And he interrupted me and told me and told me to tell you. And the guy was just blown away. He was like, so I would do things like that, you know, periodically with all the crew members to uh, to convince them that it's like, you know, hey, this is not just something by, that by some great, huge chance I might have memorized and pulled a fast one over on you about the historical aspect of it. These are things about your life that I would have absolutely no positive way of knowing. And uh, so I, that that made a believer out of everybody. So uh, that was that was the aim and the intention, and it and it happened, and it was really great. Oh. So, John, um, before I let you go, where can everybody keep up to date with your work and get hold of a copy of your fantastic second book? Ah, oh, fantastic, uh, Paul. They can look online and reach me at johnrussell.net. That's J O H N R U S S E L L dot net. And that's my psychic website that'll tell people how to get a reading with me, uh, my background, my credentials, my clients' testimonials, uh, media appearances, so on and so forth. 
uh, for my books. They can go to, for my first book, they can go to writingwithghosts.net, ghosts is plural, writingwithghosts.net. And then for the second book, A Knock in the Attic, just go to anockintheattic.net. And those are available uh, at the Amazon UK site for any UK listeners that want to pick those up there. Uh, and if they want to just know more about it before they buy it, go to one of those two sites, writingwithghosts.net or uh, knockintheattic.net. And it's got information there about the books and more about me and uh, some uh, testimonials, endorsements about the books. Uh, Uri Geller, the famous uh, psychic, has given me endorsements for both books. I'm very proud to have that. Uh, so there's a lot of neat stuff there, and they can learn more there. And there's links there to buy it, Amazon, Books A Million, all these other places, wherever you want to pick it up. Brilliant. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for your time. It's been thoroughly enthralling and engaging to speak with you for the first time. And uh, I hope and no doubt we will speak again at some point in the future. Paul, I hope so. I've enjoyed it very, very much. I appreciate you having me on, and uh, I, I hope all the listeners enjoy it. And this this has been great. This has been fascinating for me. Thank you.